morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We're glad you're here to hear God's word and receive his holy sacrament. Uh, we have a guest preacher today, a fourth year seminarian, Paul Hammes, who happens to be the fiance of our new third grade teacher, Callie Furmanhack. We're happy for Paul to be here today. You're going to see his face in the pulpit a few more times this year, as long as all goes well today. No, just kidding. <laughs> It went fine last night, so uh, we're happy to have him around and be helping out, so uh, I know you'll enjoy that. Please stand, remain standing for our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, 
receive your forgiveness and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Lord be with you. Lord God, Heavenly Father, send forth your Son to lead home his bride, the church, that with all the company of the redeemed we may finally enter into his eternal wedding feast. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for this, the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, comes from the prophet Amos, chapter 5. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters, 
and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. An epistle reading from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Good morning. It is great to be with you in God's house this morning. I was hoping that someone could read my poster. Zoe, you want to read it for us? What does it say? Be prepared. Today in our children's message, we are going to talk about how we need to be prepared to meet Jesus. But we first need to make sure we understand what does be prepared mean? When you're prepared, you're ready for anything to happen. I am planning a trip to the beach, and I want to make sure that I'm prepared. And so I need your help. I've put some items in my bag that I think will help me be prepared for the beach. So when I pull them out of my bag, if you think they'll help me be prepared, could you give me a thumbs up? Okay. I want to be ready when I go to the beach. <coughs> beach towel. Is that going to help me be prepared for the beach? Yep. That's a good thing. Sunglasses. Yep, that will help me be prepared. Swimsuit. Yeah, that will help me be prepared. And the most important thing, sunscreen. I'm going to be prepared for the beach. Thank you for helping me. Today in our Bible reading, Jesus told a story about being prepared. Listen carefully. There were ten bridesmaids. They were getting ready to meet the groom. Each bridesmaid had an oil lamp. It looked kind of like this. Five of the bridesmaids did not bring extra oil for their lamp. They were not prepared. They were not ready. The other five bridesmaids brought extra oil. They were prepared and they met the, bride, the, met the groom. Jesus told that story to remind us that we need to be prepared to meet him. We don't know the day that's going to happen. Only God knows. So how can we be prepared to meet Jesus? By believing in him. When we believe in Jesus, we read the Bible, we pray, we will be prepared to meet him whenever that is. And that's going to be a wonderful day. Let's ask God to help us be prepared. Can you fold your hands? Bow your heads, close your eyes, and repeat these words after me. Dear Jesus, help me to be prepared to meet you. In your name we pray. Amen. Boys and girls, you may get a handout and return to those who love you. Grace, peace, and mercy be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, as Pastor Pebercorn said, my name is Paul Hammes. I am a fourth year at Concordia Seminary and I'm awaiting uh, my first call in April. Uh, it's a joy to be with you this morning. I want to thank uh, Pastor Pebercorn and Pastor Roland for giving me this opportunity to preach for you this day. I also have a quick PSA. 
Uh, I have nonverbal Tourette's, so if you see my arm moving or my head moving at all, that's what that is. It's normal, uh, at least for me, so no worries there. I'm sure many of you have also noticed that uh, this week is a unique uh, week in the, the church year as far as readings go, that all three of the readings, the Old Testament, the Epistle, and the Gospel readings, all have to do with the same general topic. They all talk about the day of the Lord, Christ's return, the judgment day. So it makes it easy to know what to preach about today. So we're going to look at Matthew 25, look at our gospel reading, and dive in there. So Matthew 25 picks up in Christ's ministry. It's towards the end of his earthly ministry. He's in Jerusalem. He's only days away from being crucified, and he's preaching to the crowds. He's saying wild things. He's talking at the Temple Mount and saying that the temple is going to be destroyed, and he's going to rebuild it in three days. And he says things like, the Son of Man is going to come in the clouds again. He's saying wild things that the crowds probably don't understand what he's saying. So to help him understand, he says a parable that probably just confuses them more. And he says that this parable is about what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. It's not what it is currently like, at least not 2,000 years ago when Jesus was saying this, but it's what they can look forward to the kingdom of heaven being like. So he tells the parable that we heard just minutes ago, the parable of 10 virgins, that there's a wedding banquet going on, and 10 virgins are trying to prepare, and they're going and wait for the bridegroom. There's three groups in this parable. There's the bridegroom that they're waiting for, there's the wise virgins that brought extra oil, and there's the foolish virgins that were not prepared with extra oil. So as the bridegroom is delayed, the, all the virgins, they get distracted, they fall asleep, and when the parade of the bridegroom comes and wakes them up, the wise light their lamps, and they're ready to greet the bridegroom, while the foolish realize that they run out of oil, have no light, and have to go to the market to buy more. And while they're at the market, they miss the bridegroom and are stuck outside missing the wedding and are not welcome in. That's a great parable. Jesus is using imagery that definitely will have spoken to those 2,000 years ago. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to maybe modernize the parable a bit, maybe help us understand what he's saying in our context. So imagine a Cardinals game. And this isn't just any Cardinals game. This is a Cardinals game from the 2021-2022 season, back when we were happy. It was a great Cardinals game because Alba Pujols had just hit 699 home runs, and he was expected to hit his 700th historic home run at this game. So 10 fans go to this game. There's five foolish fans and five wise fans. The five wise fans, well, they are wise. They brought their own snacks into the park, while the five foolish fans came unprepared. And they get distracted. They, they start talking, and Alba Pujols comes up to bat. And the five wise fans, they're ready. They have their snacks ready, and they watch Pujols hit his 700th home run. And while that's happening, the five foolish fans, they're stuck in line waiting for a $30 hot dog. <laughs> and they miss the historic event. And all that they can do is go back home and watch the highlights on ESPN, knowing that they missed their chance, their one and only chance. Now, this is kind of a silly example. It's maybe a silly story about what Jesus is talking about. But what Jesus is talking about is not silly at all. It's a very important thing that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And the truth of the matter is he's talking about 10 virgins that are going to wait for the bridegroom. All 10 of them try and be ready for the bridegroom to come, but only five of them make it in. And as I'm sure you've picked up by now that the, the 10 virgins that are waiting, they are those that are waiting for God. They represent those waiting for God. And not all of them make it in. Not all of them make it into the heaven, heaven banquet. And that's terrifying. That's a scary reality that Jesus is teaching us. And this comes to fruition just a chapter later in Matthew 26, when Judas betrays Jesus. He shows that all of his disciples aren't true followers, that he does get betrayed by one of them. But the fear is still there. The fear is still that there are five that don't make it into the banquet. And that's an eternal con consequence. So to dive into this, Let's look at three questions that we might have about this parable. The first question we can look at is, what makes the wise virgins wise in this parable? And obviously, they came prepared. They brought oil. They brought extra oil to be prepared. So I thought it would be interesting to look up what the oil represents. And all the scholars, they agree that the oil represents whatever it takes for you to honor the bridegroom when he comes. 
That's kind of vague. I don't know if that really helps me prepare for the bridegroom. But the oil doesn't have to represent anything specific in this parable. It is just a parable. What we know is that they brought extra oil. So we can look at what makes them wise. And scriptures has a lot to talk about what wisdom is. So in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So we're told that fearing the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And as soon as we hear that definition, we start to realize that wisdom means that you don't look at yourself. You look at God. You look to God, true wisdom. It means that you understand who God is. You have a proper fear, a proper respect, a proper adoration of who God is, who the creator of the universe, who the giver of life is. That's where wisdom comes from, having a proper respect for that. And we see this in this parable. We see that the ten, the five wise virgins, that they're not focused on themselves. They're not worried about their convenience. They're not worried about buying extra oil and the, the problems that will occur for them. They're focused on the bridegroom, and that's their goal, to be ready to greet the bridegroom. And they're going to do whatever it takes to be ready for the bridegroom. They're going to do whatever it means for them to see the bridegroom and welcome him. Because they're not focused on themselves. They're focused on the bridegroom. They're focused on God. So the wise virgins, they don't look at themselves. They look outward. So the second question we can explore is, what makes the foolish virgins foolish? Obviously, they're not wise, they weren't prepared, they didn't bring enough oil. But it goes a little deeper than that. Proverbs also tells us in Proverbs 28 that whoever trusts in his own minds is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. So we're told that fools trust in their own mind, that they look inwardly. They're not focused on the outside, they're not focused on the bridegroom, they're worried about themselves. And we see this in the parable. The foolish virgins, they only brought enough oil for what they had in mind. They went, they were trying to see the bridegroom, but they had an, a timeline in their own head. They had their own idea of what the evening would be like, and it didn't plan out that way. And they had to pay the consequences. They were focused on their own understanding and did not trust and put their attention on the bridegroom. We see this all throughout scriptures. Our Old Testament is an example, our Old Testament reading is an example of this. In Amos, he's preaching to the Israelites that they don't have the proper understanding of who God is, that times are going well for the Israelites. There is plenty of money, there's plenty of food, and they get distracted. They start looking inwardly rather than to God. And some of them arrogantly start looking forward to the day of the Lord. And Amos is trying to tell them that that's going to be a dark day for them, that they should not be excited for the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's judgment. It's going to bring darkness. It's going to bring destruction because the Lord's a lion that's going to destroy them. Amos is trying to remind them who they should focus on and turn away from their foolish ways. Because as Jesus says in the parable, the five foolish virgins, they missed their chance. They missed their chance to go into the wedding banquet, and they're left out in the darkness. And it's, it's easy to fall into habits of the foolish virgins. It's easy to follow, fall into those ways. I know that my schedule, at best, reaches two weeks out in advance. It's hard to really plan for something that may or may not happen in our lifetime. Christ may or may not return in our lifetime. So how are we supposed to prepare for that? How are we supposed to plan for that? And we get distracted. We start looking at our own lives, at our own schedule, and stop looking at God. And sometimes signs happen. Sometimes natural disasters happen. An earthquake breaks out or a a hurricane or a war breaks out. And we're reminded of those signs of Christ's return. And then we start looking at our lives and wondering if we're really living the way that we want to when Christ returns. It's only when some outside occurrence happens that we are reminded of our fragility of life and that we start questioning if we're really prepared for God to return and if we're living the life we should be. It's easy to fall into those foolish ways to start planning out our life without understanding that it may end at any day, that Christ may return at any moment. And we have to be ready for that. We can't just push that off. We have to be ready for that at any moment. So that brings us to our third and final question. Are we the wise or the foolish virgins? Are we with the wise or the foolish? As we said, the wise, the five wise virgins, they were prepared, they had extra oil, they were looking to the bridegroom, they were looking to God. 
while the foolish virgins, they were looking inwardly, they were trusting on their own understanding, and they didn't bring enough oil. And if we want to be with the wise, we should look to God, and maybe that means that we're, that's not the right question that I'm asking. Maybe the right question I should be asking is, how has Christ prepared us? How do we know that we're prepared through Christ? Because if the wise look to Christ, if the wise look to God, that's where we should find our preparation. The only way we're going to be prepared for Christ's return is if we know who Christ is, what Christ has done for us. The truth that Christ died for you, the truth that Christ rose again from the dead, bringing forgiveness for your sins, bring redemption for you. That's the truth that makes us wise. That's the only truth that can prepare us for his return. Christ's return is all that we have, and he gives it to us. He reminds us of who he is and what he has done for us in nobly two ways. He reminds us through his word and sacrament. So we gather here today, we gather to hear his word proclaimed, we gather to read his word, study his word, digest his word, where he promises to strengthen our faith, where he promises to prepare us for his return. We get to gather together and be encouraged through his word. Then we also get to gather together to celebrate his sacraments. How do you know if you're prepared for Christ? How do you know if you're the wise? Because Christ baptized you. You've been baptized into Christ's family, and he has claimed you as his own. That's how you're prepared. How do you know if you're prepared for Christ's return? How do you know if you're with the wise? Because you partake in the sacrament. You digest his body and his blood, and he gives you forgiveness and salvation. That's the only way we can be prepared in who Christ is. So we get to live that out. We get to live out these promises, this truth, this faith that Christ gives us. And... It's not always easy to do, but we're called to do it and be ready for it any day. Because as Christ reminds us in Matthew chapter 25, verse 13, he says, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Christ is going to return. He's either going to return tomorrow or maybe in a thousand years. We're not sure. Either way, we're going to be there. We're going to see his return. Either from heaven looking down or earth looking up, we're going to be there. We're going to be there to witness it. So let's live that way and it's going to be a glorious return of his. As is described in Revelations, when Christ returns, he himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. When Christ returns, it's going to be a great day for us wise children of God. So let's lean on that. Let's find comfort in his wisdom. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Please stand. Join me now as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, 
the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We now pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, you are our helper and our deliverer. We bring to you the prayers and petitions of your people that you might grant us all things needful and guard us against all things harmful. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Righteous God, you despise corruption and yet you command justice. Embolden our rulers and those in authority to act and defend measures that preserve peace and provide justice for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, show mercy to those who cry aloud to you as they await your son's coming. We especially remember in our prayers this day Freya and Becky, Kevin and Michael, and others we name now in our hearts, that you would answer them with strength and healing and comfort and hope, that you would give them every confidence in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, your Son will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, the voice of an archangel, and the sound of a trumpet. He will raise those who have fallen asleep in you and deliver us all who believe to your kingdom of glory. Until that day, strengthen us by his body and blood that you prepare for us in this meal today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And gracious God, grant that we may not grieve as those who have no hope, but would instead rejoice and encourage one another in the promise of resurrection and life everlasting. Especially strengthen and comfort the families of Tim and others who mourn the loss of loved ones this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and good for us that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so it is with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we now laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he broke it, he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. In the same manner, also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. May this, the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen, preserve you in body and in soul to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. We give thanks, Heavenly Father, not as we ought, but as we are able. You provide daily bread and all that we need to support this body and life, and through this sacrament, you have strengthened our faith to live each day in faith toward you and in love towards others. Guide and sustain us this day and always through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace.